I like a round of applause first. I'm just hoping I get one at the end because it could be. Um, I, 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 shall I sit or shall I stand? I shall stand. First of all, please forgive my casual attire, um, but I've actually spent the day with dogs. I was told that tonight was going to be more of a fireside chat. Well, I can tell you it is because I even have dog hairs all <laughs> over my legs, which I think makes it complete. But I had an amazing um, afternoon visiting the medical detection dogs over in Milton Keynes, and I was absolutely wowed. And I did say I'm actually going to change my speech completely, and I'm going to talk about the medical detection. I'm not I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to talk about me. Um, what I, first of all, I would like to say thank you so much for inviting me here. I, uh, for somebody who didn't even go to university, I mean, I left school when I was 16, and actually, I'm, I, I'm kind of surprised now because, you know, I love knowledge. Um, I love being challenged. I love being amongst smart people. I, so I don't really get why I didn't go to university because, you know, I, I, knowing me now, I think I would have really enjoyed it, but I actually didn't thrive at school. You know, I, I wasn't terribly academic. I, and actually, the truth be known, I have got the attention span of a gnat. So I, I suspect that given a topic to, to um, actually get to grips with, you know, I'm, I'm one of those temporary, I'm a temporary expert. Whatever I'm doing at the time, I absolutely become expert on it. And about a week later, I can't even remember what it was, what I was talking about. So, so I'm not terribly sure how I would have, I would have got on the university. What I want to do, uh, if you don't mind, is I actually think it gets much more interesting when we, we can get to have a chat. So um, I'm going to kind of whiz through um, oh, my life, <laughs> whiz through my life, uh, you know, the, the sort of the key moments that led me up to being a dragon, you know, to being a, a, a business person, to being an entrepreneur, you know, and actually ending up on television. Um, and then I really want to get back to talking to you, you know, that we can have a fireside chat, which is what we were supposed to be doing. So um, I think I had my first signs of being an entrepreneur when I was about seven when um, I picked some really awful laburnum off the laburnum tree, which laburnum apparently isn't a good flower to put in vases, but I picked some off the laburnum tree and uh, I stuck them outside of our, our front gate and, uh, and put a little sign up saying, you know, whatever it was, two and six for a bunch of laburnum. And, uh, and uh, you know, and I sat there and nothing happened. And, uh, and then I looked across and I thought, oh, I know why nothing's happening because the cars are driving that way and they actually can't see me. They can't see my flowers. So what I'll do, I'll go and put them over there on the neighbour's drive. So I put them over on the neighbour's drive and I sat there very bad and I sold some. And the neighbour was blinking furious. So she, she marched, you know, marched in to see my mother and said, do you know what your daughter's up to? And, and my mother looked at me and she went, that is bad girl, bad girl. And I could just see the pride in my mother's face. Which was <laughs> location, location, location. She's got, the, she's got it already. But I genuinely, do you know, I think why I'm an entrepreneur, I think why I decided I wanted to go into my own business is actually I'm not sure I could work for anybody else. I've had one job. Um, this is going to make you giggle, but please try and keep a straight face. My one and only job was as a sales room model. You did well. You were good. You did well. Um, the only thing I had to be, it was working for a fashion house, and the only thing I had to be was five foot ten tall. It's one thing in life you can't lie about. I actually, to be honest, I don't think you should ever lie, but there's one thing in life that you can't lie about, and that's your height. Because as soon as you walk in the room, they know how tall you are. And I walked into the room, and this guy said to me, but you're not five foot ten, are you? And I said, oh, but no. Chuckle Marty was amazing. Uh, no, I know, I know, but I will work so hard. I will be really, really good. And he gave me a chance. And all five foot two of me, I never modelled any of the clothes. He wasn't going to sell any if I modelled them, but he gave me a chance. Um, and I absolutely hated it. I realised immediately, I, I just didn't want to, I just don't take instruction terribly well. And, and I realised immediately I didn't want to do it, but he had been good to me. And I stayed there for about nine months of hating it. And then I thought, actually, I've done my bit now. I paid him back and I moved on. But it was a, it was a pivotal moment for me because I thought, I can't work for anybody. I need to go out and find something that I can do for myself. Um, that something was... Um, well, what I, what I realised very quickly, I was, I, was in, I, was in, I was at home and I wasn't really doing anything and nothing was really happening. And I just thought, you know what, if you don't do anything in life, nothing happens. You know, that's, that's guaranteed. Do nothing, nothing happens. So I took myself off. I had some friends in Italy and I took my, you know, set, got the money together and flew off to Italy uh, and kind of changed my life, just changed my scenery. And from that, the first business idea came. It was to bring ceramics from Italy back into the UK. Had no money. 
Um, at the time, there was this thing called factoring. It's like invoice discounting. So, you know, I was able to fund it through that. Um, and I had an absolute ball and it was a complete failure. Uh, I ran up about £3,000 worth of debt on my credit cards, uh, which at the time might not sound like a lot of money at the time when you haven't got it and you've got to pay it back. It, it was a lot of money. Um, but I got a taste for it. I just thought, oh, I, I, know, I know what I did wrong. Um, but actually, I really it gave me a buzz. Even getting it wrong was, was kind of, yeah, OK, but if I did it next time, I'd do it like this. So I was kind of off. And that was my first business. It was a failure. It taught me a huge amount. And what it, the, one of the big things it taught me is that actually I kind of learn better through the things I get wrong than the things I get right. The things I get right, I have a momentary yes and then I'm off. The things I get wrong, I really don't like that feeling. And it, I, I understood very quickly that the way to get myself, you know, to get, I had to, if you get it wrong, you, you beat yourself up for about 30 seconds, you pick yourself up and you think, you know what, I'm not going to be doing that again. Luckily, the next business, it was something I'd seen in Italy. So something came out of the whole Italian thing. Um, it was a, a business called Stefanel. I don't know if any of you know, but it's a fashion business called Stefanel. And, uh, and I'd seen in Knightsbridge, there was a shop, a Stefanel shop. I thought, oh, I've just seen that in Italy. And I popped in there and I said, oh, uh, where's the head office? And they said, oh, downstairs. So I thought, oh, um, I was thinking about, are you doing any franchises in the UK? I'm 19, 20, 19. Are you thinking about doing any franchises in the UK? And they said, oh, actually, well, yeah, our, um, our MD's downstairs and we are. And I sort of bounced in and convinced Carlo Magello to, um, to, to offer me one of the first franchises in the UK. And, and that was my first business success. And, you know, and, then, and then I felt what it was like to get it right. Um, that lasted probably for about 18 months, two years. And then I realised, I actually, the franchise model, I, I, it was a good starter but I quite like to own my own business. Um, and so that I then went into, oh, you'll love this one. I then went into prize bingo. I am a damn good bingo caller, if ever, I'm, I'm your girl. Um, but actually, you know, it didn't matter to me. It didn't matter what I was doing. It didn't matter what it was glamorous. I didn't care what field it was in. I love business and I still do. I think anybody watches Dragon's Den can see that. I just love business. And then I just worked. I just worked. There was nothing magical to it. You know, I didn't think I'm going to be a millionaire. I didn't think my aim in life is to make millions. I put my head down. Occasionally, well, not occasionally. I say I put my head down. I actually, I'm a scanner. You know, I'm constantly looking for opportunity. And it doesn't matter what it is. I don't care whether it's prize bingo. I don't care whether it's fashion. I don't care whether it's holiday parks. You know, I'm interested in opportunity. And if you, if you, if you watch it, if you, if you keep your eye on it and look out for it and then take it, you know, one day after all of that work, I looked up and I thought, blimey, I, it's a success. I've made money. And in an even su more surprising moment, when I sold my ultimate holiday park business, I was a millionaire. And I, I don't know how it, I don't know. I can't, you know, people say to me, you know, what do you do? How, do you, how does that happen? And I'd love to say, well, you flick a row of switches and at the end of it, that happens. And I can't. All I can say is that I kept my, you know, I kept my head. I was watching what was going on. I was feeling the mood and I was working bloody hard. And, and, and then one day it all happened. I'm going to, I buzzed through it quite quickly because the bit that I think most people are really interested in is Dragon's Den. <laughs> and Strictly Come Dancing. I've been in business 35 years and the most questions I get now are about Strictly Come Dancing. It's very annoying. Um, so anyway, I had, you know, I'd had lots of businesses and actually they'd got more, they got bigger and bigger and more and more successful and I had an ultimate exit of my holiday park business. Um, and, and about a week after the exit, I got a call from BBC saying, would you like to go on Dragon's Den? And I said, oh, no, thank you. I've worked really very hard to have a lovely life and, and, and it's all, it's, it's very nice and I really don't need to be in the spotlight and I really don't need the media to make their own mind up on the way my life is going to be. So thank you, but no thank you. And they came back a second time and I said, I said no the first time. I said it very politely, but you know, look for somebody else. And then they come back a third time and, uh, and they said, look, no commitment, just come along try, you know, have a tryout. And they put me in a room with Duncan Bannatyne and Richard Farley and they brought some entrepreneurs into pitch for me. And, you know, it was, it was the most peculiar sensation. It was home. It was, I just thought, oh, 
this is what I do. This is, this, is, this is my life. I feel really, really comfortable here. And having gone from, no, no, really, I'm not interested. I've got a lovely life, thank you. You can, you know, you, you can, you can go away and do your media thing elsewhere. Suddenly I'm thinking, if they don't offer me that seat in Dragon's Den, I am going to be gutted. About seven days before we started filming, I got my husband's in the audience here and he will remember. I actually had to say to them, just so you know, I've got businesses, so I don't have a clear diary. You, know, you can't just say to me, you know, well, I need 20 days in you know, three days time. You're going to have to confirm. If not, you've lost me. Um, and about seven days before we started filming, they, I got the call saying, would you like to be on Dragon's Den? Just, I'm like, well, I might. <laughs> Anyway, I did. Um, eat all the time, thinking, you know what, I'll do it for a year, maybe. If I don't like it, I won't do it again. Uh, 10 years, 13 series, I've been on Dragon's Den. And I am loving every minute of it. Minute of it. And if anybody watches Dragon's Den, I can, I can tell you why I love it, and I hope you'll find it very reassuring. It is as close to business on television. We're on television. But it is as close to real business that you're going to get on television because it is our money. Because although you only see five to 10 minutes of a pitch, those pitches can take up to three and a half hours. So there is a lot more information that we gather. And actually it's the bit that outside of the, you know, the business bit outside of, of the den, people come and pitch to you for two, maybe three hours. So, so that bit is exactly the same. And what we're doing, we're agreeing to, to do business with these people. We're agreeing to go into invest in them. Um, and then, of course, we come out and do all the normal things. We do the due diligence. You know, some of them, most of them go through. Some of them don't go through. Um, and, and, and I've done other things. I've done Strictly Come Dancing. Um, but Dragons feels like home to me. And it still feels like home to me. Um, so long may it continue. I did say I was going to be really quick. Yeah. What I did, actually, I talked really quick. I don't know if you <laughs> noticed. I, just, I, 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 I took um, 15 minutes to, to say about half an hour's worth of words. But I will sit down now and hopefully we can have a chat. <laughs> So I'll uh, just begin by asking a few questions myself, and then we'll open up to audience questions. So my first question is that obviously you're a dragon with a capital D on TV, but uh, would you say that you're a dragon off screen? And if not, which animal do you think best oh. describes you? <laughs> oh no, I hate that one. <laughs> um, so I, I have this thing about, just so you know, I am absolutely, that is me on Dragon's Den. A lot of people, when they meet me, say, well, actually, you know, you're, you're much softer and, you know, you've got a, you laugh a lot. I've got a lot of laughter. You do not get laughter lines like this without laughing a lot. So, <laughs> so I have a lot of fun in life. But in Dragon's Den, people are asking us for our money and they're either, you know, they do it. They do it sometimes with great skill. They do it with great respect. Some people actually complete with the ones that really annoy me are the ones who just waste that opportunity, you know. And when you see me angry and frustrated, it's like, really, you had an amazing shot at this and, and, you've, and you've let it go. So I am that person. I make no excuses. You know, that is absolutely me. But my thing is, nobody is one thing. Nobody's one thing. You know, in television kids you into thinking you know this person because you see that particular angle of them. You know, all of us have got a thousand facets to us. You know, we're all, and please remember that in life because, you know, sometimes we even try to be one thing. We convince ourselves that we're this, you know, well, that's crazy. You know, we're all, we're, we're all everything. What animal would I be? Um, well, I know specifically my cat Friday. <laughs> he and I, I think we're very similar. I don't know, I ought, to, I ought to ask my husband. Yeah, but, but my cat Friday, I think. Uh, not any cat, my cat Friday. cat Friday. Very independent young man. Yeah, <laughs> and if only he could work the till, I'm absolutely sure he'd be an entrepreneur. Um, as you say that you're often described as having quite a tough and matter-of-fact approach, uh, do you think it's impossible to be successful in the business world by taking a softer approach, or is this just the manner that has worked best for you? 
No, I don't think, again, it goes back to this in one facet. I mean, you cannot, I was at the, at the height of my businesses employing 1,500 people. And the thing, if you ask any of my employees, I remember them, I know their names, I know when they've had children, I know, not 1,500 of them, but the people I came across. Um, and, and Paul always said to me, not just the people who work for me, my customers, you know, I used to get to know the customers. You cannot bark at people all day, every day, and expect them to, in, you know, expect them to perform well and enjoy working for you. Um, but Dragons hones into, you know, a, a particular aspect, and so it should. Dragons is there to show um, the points of business, not the soft bits around business, but the points of business. You know, so I think that's why, you know, and if I, if I have a frustration, it, 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 it will be that people, you know, they, they'll, they'll think, they, they assume they know, they get me, they know me. But there's another side to you as well. Yeah, <laughs> and there should be, you know, I think, you know, anybody who thinks they can bark their way through business and demand, and particularly now, your generation, very different, you know, there was a time when you could tell people, you know, but, but you can't, if you want to get the best out of people, you need, you know, you want, you want people along with you, you want, I want to be, I want to be surrounded by people who are a lot better than me at stuff and wanting to be better than me, you know, and being better than me. Course. That's definitely definitely worked for, worked for you. Um, during your course on the show, is it about three point five million pounds worth of investments that uh, you've made? Do you listen to Graham Norton? Not Graham no. Norton. <laughs> no, the only reason I say he said two point five million, and oh, I really? suddenly get really competitive. I suddenly go, no, it's three point five million. No, <laughs> listen, if you spent three point five million, you want to say it? You I were did, right. I did go. I did see a couple <laughs> of different figures, and I, I thought I'd go for the high, <laughs> highest you're one. Good. So. Yeah, see, you're good. She's good. She'll get on well. <laughs> um, so you've made investments from kind of Steri Spray to Fitmix. Is it possible to single out a favourite? Not a favourite. Um, uh, there's a lovely... I'm a love the one I'm with girl. You know, honestly, if, whichever bit investment I am with, I, they absolutely have my full time and attention, you know. And if I'm working on that investment, that is it. I've got no other investment in the world. But there is a fantastic story. A 13-year-old... Um, guy called Jordan who had been bullied out of school, he was home tutored, bullied out of school, home tutored, very, very smart guy, a bit awkward, a bit socially awkward, but very, very smart. Um, I had moved out of home, was living with his grandfather and they were putting blinds up in his bedroom and uh, they couldn't get the blinds to stay up on the plasterboard. So he and his, gra his granddad says to him, come on then Jordan, let's go and design something and they design this plasterboard fixing that is strong enough to put blinds up. Um, they got the good sense to realise they might have something and they patent it. And he come, when he's 18, he comes into the den and pitches. This is last year. And uh, we are now in 3,000 stores across the... We are the strongest plasterboard fixing in the world. We're in 3,000 stores across the UK and just signing a deal with Hillman in the States for 10,000 stores. And that, to me, uh, is brilliant. It's... This... I take this as I mean it, it isn't changing my life, but for me, that's what Dragon's about. It absolutely has changed Jordan's life and I've seen him grow. You know, it's not just about the money. I've watched Jordan realise, you know, I can do this, this is it's brilliant. I absolutely love it. So I, I say it's not me, but if you ask me about one of my others, I get just as enthusiastic <laughs> about it. <laughs> and uh, to, to be a bit meaner, what, what about the worst pitch you've ever heard. Oh, can you tell easy. us about well, one No, of I could list. Well, does it have to be the worst? Can I not give you six? Yeah, one of the false, worst will do. <laughs> false fingernails for cats. <laughs> false I fingernails ask, for false cats. False fingernails for cats, I ask you. Oh, well, well, just, uh, just, lots just of just different colours as well. Um, and the one I absolutely loved, and it, they were so, and even when they left the, I, no, I didn't love it because I just thought, I know you're going to, I just know you're going to do it. I just know, because we were all wrong. All the dragons were wrong. He'd come up with this idea that um, you can't get a beach bed when you go on the beach. You can't get one of those sunbeds, which is often true. So what you do is you get a suitcase. He designed a suitcase that had a bed inside it so that you took that on holiday with you. And then when you went to the beach, you took your suitcase with this beach bed in it. <laughs> and you know when you think, I actually don't know. I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I have. I, I <laughs> we did try to stop him. But, well, I've got a feeling he did it. Um, as you say, you're known, of course, for uh, being a dragon. But obviously, as you also mentioned, uh, many people know you for Strictly Come Dancing. So which, which have you enjoyed the most? Or is it 
is it impossible to yeah I don't think you can compare. rate them I mean that's you know sometimes you just can't say what is better I mean dragons is home and and when I when I'm there I, you know I sit down in my chair and it's just, I'm not working you know it's just I love it and I, and I, I because I love business and even the crazy people <laughs> just call this is on YouTube so cut that uh, no even the crazy pitches um, you know I think I actually admire them that you know they're doing they're, they're, they've got off their backsides and they're standing and they're pitching strictly so I'm at home there and I know what I'm doing and I feel very confident and comfortable strictly I was terrified I mean I've never been so scared because you are dancing live in front of 11 million people I'm not a performer I'm not a dancer and they say things like to me act coy it's like <laughs> Well, A, I would find it quite hard to act coy, but I mean, you know, I'm not an actor, so I found, but I loved it. I loved it because I was constantly on my metal, you know, it brought me to a place that I just constantly had to, you know, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable doing business. I know how it works, but actually being in a place where you're constantly scared and you're constantly having to be your best is actually quite a, it's, I really enjoyed it. That's great. And who's, who's the tougher judge, Peter Jones or Craig Weatherhood? <laughs> Honest. I like Craig. I think Craig tells the truth. I like that. You know, I, 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 I um, yeah, no, I think they're both honest. Can't tell you that. Do you know, you can't always, you can't always rate. You can't always say one, two, three. Yeah. They're just different. Um, so when Anna Win Wintour came and spoke here last year, she said that the best advice she ever received was to, uh, get fired. And I was just wondering, have you ever fired anyone that has gone on to be a huge success? No, and I wouldn't remember them if I had, <laughs> only because I don't remember failures. I beat myself up at the time and then I move on, so I couldn't possibly sit down. I don't actually, have I? I've had, um, what's been very nice, there's been some people who've gone on from working for me to be successes, <laughs> which is exactly the opposite question to the one you just asked. Very good, wait <laughs> just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, as you said, you mentioned um, with was it Jordan who you saw watching him learn and grow to become better businessmen. But do you really think that entrepreneurship is something that can be taught, or do you think it's something that an instinct that some people are born with? Well, the first thing I want to do is differentiate between being a business person and being an entrepreneur, because being an entrepreneur, everybody in business now calls themselves an entrepreneur, and actually partly Dragon's Den's got something to do with that. I know a lot of really, really successful people who are not entrepreneurs. They're not entrepreneurial, you know, they've made a lot of money, they've done very well, thank you very much, but they haven't, to be, I think, to be an entrepreneur, you've got to be that person who spots opportunity, takes it, and that doesn't mean once. You know, when I look in the history of successful entrepreneurs, they're doing it all of the time. Um, so, yeah, I, do, I think there's a big difference. Now, therefore, I think there's things that you can learn to make you better in business. You can absolutely definitely learn and, so, and should. And, you know, uh, I wish I had. I, 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 I learned through mistakes. You know, I probably could have made less mistakes had I paid a bit more attention. Um, but I do think there are personality traits. And when I see... All entrepreneurs don't look the same, they don't behave the same, but what I do see in entrepreneurs, they're risk takers. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're emotional intelligent, they're what, they're scanners, they're what, observation, you know. If they, when I think of all of the dragons, they will pick up the tiniest little nuances in people, you know, they, they understand people's body language, you know. We're, sometimes we'll sit in the den and all five of us will just think, there's something. I don't know what it is. And it's just we're picking up on something. So I do think there are characteristics. But, I, you know, that doesn't mean to say that there isn't a piece that says you, you should learn aspects of business. Certainly should. So if, if you are trying to learn, what do you think is the best way to teach it? Um, as you mentioned, you yourself didn't go to university. Do you think that university degrees have become redundant in the business world? I think it entirely depends what business you're in. I mean, if you're in a special business, if, if you are in a specialist business, then, then I think having specialist knowledge would absolutely help. And I think university teaches you many things. You know, it teaches you, it teaches you to learn. It teaches you to um, have good judgment, you know, to how to have good judgment, how to consider things. So, you know, I, I think it's down to the person. And I also think university has its place... It doesn't matter why you do it. If you want to go to university, go to university. If you don't want to go to university, don't go to university. You know, it's, yeah. it, has, it has value in itself, doesn't it? But I, I, personally, I, by the time I, re I don't recruit people now, I don't actually work in any businesses. I've got 30 businesses I'm invested in, but I don't actually work, so I don't recruit anymore. Um, 
but certainly whilst I take un took university degrees into account, I was still very interested in hearing, you know, the story, the life story of the person as well. Oh, great. Um, and obviously throughout your career, you've been undoubtedly incredibly busy um, with all of your various ventures. So do you find it incredibly hard to take time off and just stop and relax? I don't think I do find it hard. I don't know. I've got my husband. <laughs> <laughs> it's like having the truth fairy in the room. It's <laughs> no, I think so. When I when we go on holiday, I absolutely can have downtime and I ride. So I so um, we've got a place in Somerset and I ride and we've got the animals. And I find when I'm actually riding, when I've absolutely got downtime, I can do it. I do find it quite hard when I'm working. I'm working, you know, it's very hard to get my attention. Yeah, it is. Um, but but I know I um, I think I can do downtime. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can. Um, there's just one or two questions more from me before I move on to the audience. And the next one is that, so I read in a Guardian article that you've been quoted saying that you weren't a feminist. And I was just wondering why, why is it that you didn't identify as a, as a feminist? Well, I don't really identify as anything. I, I, I said quite recently, I'm not a woman in business. I'm in business. Mm -hmm. You know, I just don't think the whole... I don't think... The, the point is, we're all equal. Yeah. You know, we're all different, but we're all equal. And I think kind of taking a stance that says we're not just reinforces the thing that we're not. So I think the best thing I can do in business is get on and be good and people accept me as good at what I do it doesn't really matter about my gender it doesn't mean to say listen I get it you know I've you know we've all everybody has prejudices you know that's whether you're fat you're short you're tall you're male you're female everybody has views when they meet people it's very easy to pick up on the gender thing because it's very very obvious it's like race you know black white you know male female um it's it it, it, it is obvious but I think you give it strength mm -hmm. when you see it and I always say, if I stand and take my gender into account, anybody I'm talking to does exactly the same thing because I'm telling them to. Mm -hmm. I'm signalling to them, gender's a point here, gender's an issue. You know, how, however, I, you know, I, I'm genuinely confused when people uh, take, take it into it. It's like, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? I've been quite lucky because I've always been the customer. Yeah. That means, so, you know, people have wanted to deal with me there's a couple of moments in my life I've had to say, you need to get over it. And if you don't get over it, go and deal with somebody else. But, you know, and that, that I know that I am in a fortunate position to do that. And now I'm just a dragon. I'm not a man <laughs> or a woman. I'm just a dragon now. So nobody, nobody does the whole gender thing on me now. Have you felt like some of those attitudes has, have changed, like as a result of maybe a changing society or just because you become more successful and, um, and more and more successful and as such that deserves more, more respect in itself? It, I mean, it, it's hard for me because what does happen, people People do change around. I hope I haven't changed much, but people do change around you, you know. So, so it's it's very. In I find it really interesting to watch people how they, you know, how they react towards me. So it's hard for me to tell, but I do observe, and I do think that that the younger, the younger the pe sorry, the younger people are that I meet and deal with, the less the issue is. So I do okay. think I hope it's working its way through, yeah. you know. I think, and these things they don't change overnight, you know. Uh, but I do, yeah, I do. I definitely see less and less. You know, it it's really is l not an issue for a, for a lot of the younger yeah. people that I work with. Um, so the last question for me is that um, on top of your incredible work as a businesswoman, you've also done a lot of charity work, and in particular, I was quite interested about the uh, microfinance charity that you worked with, Lem with Care, and I was just wondering if finally you'd be able to just explain a little bit about that and why you've enjoyed um, working with that charity. Well, I so I I my approach to charity is that um, if I'm going to engage with a charity, I want to know about the charity so I don't engage with anything until I've seen it on yeah. the ground because I've seen lots of words I've seen lovely glossy brochures and then when you get to actually visit it's not quite what you think so um, uh, first thing I did with them with care they approached me they said you know a lot of our entrepreneurs are women it would be <laughs> I'm talking about gender now look 
uh, having said I know, but a lot of our entrepreneurs, it, these, so what Lend With Care does is it's microfinancing in third world countries and it is usually women. It is often the women who are getting the money to you know, set themselves up a market stall or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so for the, in their environment, it's quite helpful to have something that someone they identify with. So um, would I please go over and have a look? Um, would I go make a trip? And, uh, and see whether or not I want to engage with, with Lend With Care. And I'd been to Cambodia, Paul and I had been to Cambodia just after the war. So it was a broken country. I mean, it was when we tried, we were backpacking through it and, and it was, uh, uh, there was some, it was all, some really awful things. So um, I said, actually, I would like to go back. Apart from this, I'd like to see how, how it's mended itself um, and to see how Lend With Care could help yeah. with that. And so I visited with Lend With Care, visited a lot of entrepreneurs. They're not entrepreneurs. I mean, we call them entrepreneurs, but they're just trying to make a better life for themselves, you know. And sometimes it's £50 to buy themselves a basket so they can take the tomatoes to the market. Um, you know, but it was actually quite humbling because... Yeah, I'll tell you one very quick story. There was a lady there who had sewing skills yeah. and she'd borrowed the money to um, buy a sewing machine. And, um, and I had a chat with her and I said, oh, so, you know, how's that changed your life? She said, well, it's absolutely brilliant um, because uh, it's meant that I've been able to teach all of my, I've got all my friends in, I've taught them how to sew and now they're able to buy themselves sewing machines. And I said, oh, and what about, you know, what about your life? And she said, well, yeah, that's what I was talking about. I said, but you were actually talking about your friends. She said, but they are my, they were my life. And it was very interesting for me to watch how somebody, how, how community was still working, you know, how they were still, her reward, her, her you know, it wasn't profit, it wasn't cash. It was the fact that she was able to help her community and her friends. And I just came back and thought, blimey, we've got some stuff to learn from these people. You know, it, it kind of boils it back down to the basics when you, when you, you know, and we miss that. We miss that. We're all about cash and profit and that's the end of it. I know that sounds weird coming from a dragon that, you know, because <laughs> we sit and talk about cash all the time, but the truth, you know, there, profit isn't just money. It's the, it, you know, it's the stuff, the, the difference you can make, the your, 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 your prized outcome. And if you can reach that, that's your profit. Thank you for that. Um, we'll start off by opening up uh, for questions from the floor. Uh, I'll first go to that. Is Alice doing the microphone? Hi, um, I was just wondering, especially early on in your career when you were starting, when you had done the research and you intuitively felt like you did have a good idea, how did you find the right people to turn to for help? Um, <coughs> Well, I'm going to have to own up. I didn't really do any research. Um, I was kind of fortunate enough. I didn't have any money. And I kind of... Um, so I went to Italy. And uh, a friend of mine was a fashion designer. And while I was in Italy, there was an exhibition on of beautiful homewares. And I was honestly... had nothing to do for the day. And I sort of went into this exhibition and saw this lovely stuff. And, and just thought, well, it's very... it's beautiful. This is the business that failed, by the way, so don't take this as a model. It's very lovely. Um, found four of those companies, convinced them that I could bring it over to the UK. No research whatsoever. In fact, I'm going to be honest now, I went over because I had a boyfriend over there. <laughs> That's a very good reason to go over to, uh, go over to Italy. Um, had an absolute ball, but, but I didn't do any research and I didn't plan. And actually, I'm going to say something very odd. I, I, absolutely, you've got to research. You've got to understand your market to a point. So... All of your research, I always say do all of your, don't get emotionally engaged. I love this thing about get really passionate. Don't get passionate. Now I would, my advice would be do your research, understand your market, understand your route to market. And then if you're convinced, draw a line under it and then get passionate and don't let anybody else talk you out of it. I, my first business got into debt because I put it on, put, I actually funded it through credit card. And, and I was lucky enough to use um, a factoring invoice discounting because it was the type of business that you could do that. Um, I think friends and family are the obvious choice, but you need to be very, very careful because you need to make sure that they understand it's a business relationship. And particularly at the beginning when you're young, it's quite hard to have those difficult conversations where you actually say, you know, guys, health warning here, you could lose your money. You know, so, so I think if you're going to go with friends and family, you need to be really, really... You, if you can't have the conversations, you shouldn't borrow from your friends and family because anything left unsaid is exactly where it's going to 
come apart. So, you know, friends and family, you know, banks lend money. But, you know, I, it drives me mad at the moment. People are kind of, banks, aren't, banks are lending. Banks are just not lending to bad business. You know, banks got into trouble through lending to bad business. Banks actually do lend money to the right businesses now. Crowdfunding's fantastic. You know, I don't know whether you want money, we're talking about money or whether you want support, crowdfunding's fantastic. You know, or finding a mentor in the same business that, that you're wanting to go into. I could go on, <laughs> but I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. The next question, if we just go to that. Hi, Deborah. Firstly, thank you very much for coming to Oxford Union. Okay. Um, with regards to ja Dragon's Den, one of the scenarios that I find really interesting are when all the dragons want to invest uh, and the entrepreneur has to choose which dragon they want to go with. If you were an entrepreneur um, pitching to the dragons, which dragon would you choose to go for, considering they went with the same conditions, same amount of money and cut? Which dragon would you choose and why? Me. Oh, uh, excluding, <laughs> excluding yourself, of course. <laughs> Um, do you know that's a hard one because what what nobody should do and this is very uh, this is a good, really good question because I watch it in Dragon's Den often people have decided when they come up those stairs they know the dragon they want you can see it you know the eyes <laughs> they'll pitch to me and it's just like there are four other or they'll pitch to Peter and I'll think oh great you know um, but actually they can change their mind because again don't forget people are forming views on us what they uh, how they see us on television. When they get into the den, they should change their views because they're seeing a lot more about us. So that doesn't really answer your question. What does answer your question is, depending on my business, I would choose a different dragon because we all have different skill sets. We all have different expertise and I shouldn't just be going on something that I thought outside of the den. I should be reading what's <coughs> happening in the den, listen to the questions, who's asking me the most intelligent, the most engaged questions, who can tell me what they can do for my business better? And the answer is always me. <laughs> so you would decide on skill rather than personality? Totally. You're not, you're not, when you're looking for an investor, you're not looking for a friend. Yeah, it's great. You know, listen, as it happens, I genuinely, I love my investments. I mean, Paul, I get so excited. I, l I really like the people that I'm, that I'm working with. It hasn't always been so. I would say there's two or three people. I've come out of the den and thought, you know what? Life's too short. <laughs> and I've actually handed their shares back. But I'm not, but, but that was, that was for different. There were some issues in there as well. But you're not looking for a friend. You are looking for an investor, somebody who can actually take your business forward. What's more important, the person or the product, would you say? Well, the, the, you know, the, 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 the gold is actually when you get both. Um, I do worry, a lot of people say, well, of course, I invest in the person. But actually, if the product's bad, you've got a good person wasting a lot of time on a bad product. Yeah. So I'd, I won't do that. You know, I, I would employ a good person, but I wouldn't. If somebody thinks that their product's really good and they're putting their all into it, it wouldn't matter how good they were. Something tells me their judgment is not quite right. Great, let's go for the next question. Let's go for just there. Hello. Um, as a student who graduated last year, um, I was wondering if you had any advice for graduates as you leave college, uh, as you leave university, because it's quite difficult because you're home for most of the jobs they're saying, do you have like years of experience, which I'm not sure where to get necessarily from. And it might be a slightly cheeky question, but um, I know you said you're not recruiting anymore, but with the business you got in, is there any chance I can send you my CV? I love her. Opp talk about taking opportunity. Brilliant. <laughs> um, it's hard for me to give advice. I actually, because I haven't, it, I, was, I, was never, I wasn't a graduate. However, I, am, I do still see the receiving end. Um, honestly, I th it is very, very, it is tough out there. But you've just got to do, it goes back to me saying, if you do nothing, nothing happens. And sometimes you've got to change something. If you keep doing the same thing, if you're writing the same CVs, you're making the same applications, you're looking, send, you know, you're writing to the same sort of businesses, just stop and think, I've got to do something completely different here. And sometimes it can be moving yourself into a different place, you know, and actually saying, I'm not even going to try and do the thing that I wanted to do. I'm going to do something over here. Because it's, it's amazing, once you've taken a step, how the next step followed. I didn't, I haven't, I don't plan. 
this will really surprise people. I don't pl I, no, I have short-term plan, I have business plan, and then I'm completely flexible on it. You know, it's business plans. I said, do everybody have a business plan and be completely prepared to move off it? You know, because, it, because life doesn't go to plan. Just do something, and if it's not working, change it. You know, change whatever it is that you've got to change. Change your stamp, or change where you're sending your applications to. Change your CV. You know, go and meet people and talk to every the world and his wife. Do what you've just done to me and say, you know, any chance because one day somebody will get impressed by it and say, yeah. Go for just back there. Thank you. Uh, I have a series of questions. So, uh, first of all, uh, one of the other cast members, Hilary Duvey, um, if I'm not uh, saying her name wrong, Hilary Duvey, one of the cast members. Oh, Hilary. Yeah. In a uh, documentary in BBC, she kind of alluded that everyone is a Machiavellian and, uh, you know, in order to be successful, you have to be a Machiavellian. What are your ideas on that? That's number one. Another thing that you mentioned earlier that you would employ a good person. What, uh, what makes a good person? Can you illuminate that a little? Thank you so much. So, um, Machiavellian, um, do you have to be? No. I think you can absolutely, now's your moment to choose how you want to be in business. I have always said, I want to be able to sleep at night. I want to be, I want to be, I want to be happy with the person I am. And actually, I hate to sound smug, but I am. <laughs> I am smug and I'm happy. Um, and that is, but that's because I, I decided how I wanted to be. I want to be straight down the line. I don't want people guessing with me. I deal with stuff. People don't have to think, oh, is, she, is, is everything all right? Because they know, you know. Uh, now, that works for a lot of people. It scares a lot of people because they're not used to it. Um, personally, I think life is an awful lot easier if everybody just told the truth. It just said what they meant, said what they wanted, said how they wanted to behave, said what they did. It would be so much easier. I think the whole Machiavellian thing is slightly old-fashioned. I don't think your generation do that in the same way. I do think you talk in a much straighter way. I find it really refreshing. I find young people are much, much better at saying what they mean and what they think. And I think that's partially because the way we now work on social media, you know, th there's no room for lying anymore because you can't lie. You will be found out. And ma being Machiavellian kind of relies on you there's a little bit of deceit in there, you know? So I personally don't agree with that at all. It's entirely up to you what you want, how, the type of business people you want to be. I just want to be straight, easy to deal with, you know, and honest. And, and that's, I hope anybody, you know, listen, I'm not, this will really surprise you, I'm not perfect. Um, but I'm not perfect, but that's my aim. And, and, and what was the second part of the question? But what's a good person? I mean, if you were to, for instance, submit all of our CVs, uh, you know, <laughs> 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 what would be one skill that would uh, sort of differentiate that person amongst everyone here? Yes, you know, everyone here is an Oxford student, but that's would be one that well that's very hard because you never judge per a person on one thing do you i mean again it's trying to this we do this as humans we try to boil down what you know what's your favorite what's your one thing what's your it's very very hard to do that because it usually is a combination personally um i look i i really value emotional intelligence i think it it really gives you good judgment and if you ask me the single aspect or what really if I had to say if I if you forced me to say one reason I was successful it's because I I am I've I've got good judgment I've got good judgment because I read people well and I bother to read people well I listen I talk to them I listen to them so I would be looking not the thing that said I've got good emotional t intelligence you know I've got high level of what I'd be looking for is in their CV and the way they structure it somebody who I felt had good instinct had good judgment had you know understood understood me as well this is the other thing I'd say about CVs I know when a CV the same CV has been sent off to 150 people mm -hmm. because it's the same CV and it's not targeted at me and you've got to make your CVs you, I've got to feel like you have applied for my job you know and, and too many people just get that CV and they bang it out there as, to as many people as possible I want to know why me you know why have you cho why have you chosen me and my organization to work for tell me Thank you. Uh, we'll just come back down here to the front.
Um, so earlier you said that um, one of the great things about Dragon's Den is how close it is to real business. And one of the programmes that Dragon's Den is often compared to or coupled with is, of course, The Apprentice, um, which has come under a lot of criticism for being increasingly with every series, le has less credentials with every series, it's getting more gimmicky, more like reality TV all the time, and that it's losing what was good about it in the first series, going into tabloids, that kind of thing. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that without incriminating any of your <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> no. no, I think The Apprentice, it's a good question. I think The Apprentice is a very different program. I mean, Apprentice started on BBC Two, and I've always said if Dragons ever went from BBC Two to BBC One, I probably wouldn't be, I would leave. Uh, and that's because um, it's, it's a wider audience, and there's a different expectation of the audience from BBC One. It's BBC One's job to provide to its audience. You know, it's, you know, its job is to provide what it expects. Dragon's Den wouldn't sit there very well because you've actually got to, you've got to, you've got to concentrate, you've got to engage, you've got to, you know, you've got to really be very interested in business. I think what The Apprentice does really well, this is a very diplomatic answer, is that what The Apprentice does very well is it actually entertains and, and you get glimpses of business. The truth of the matter is, Nobody runs a business like that. Well, if they do, they wouldn't last very long. I mean, you know, getting people into your boardroom going, you're fired, is not, you know, is not the way you do it. But I do think it has a place. And I do, there's, you know, there's a lot of, it is interesting. And anything that engages people in business, I think is good. You know, anything that, that makes people think, do you know, I could give it a go. Even if they're saying, well, they're, you know, they're idiots, I could do better. It doesn't matter. You know, I, I think it, I definitely, it has value. It has a place. And it obviously does. It's very, very popular. But Dragons is better. Um, thanks. Yes, the man in the check shirt. Thank you. Uh, looking back over the 13 series you said you've done on Dragons Den, what was the one that got away? What was the one that you didn't didn't accept the pitch, uh, and they and they went on to do really really well? And you look back and think, well, if only. Well, the first thing, I'm not a well if only girl. I, I genuinely, I, I'm just not, you know, I give it my all. I get it or I don't get it. I've got 29 businesses I'm really, really happy with. You know, I'm not, I, I don't need more businesses. And either I do a deal on the terms that, that you know, I think are fair terms or we don't do the deal. Um, there, there have been, and, and I genuinely mean, I don't, it's a fantastic reason to be wrong when people go on and make a huge success. I mean, what, what a lovely, what, you know, that's a great way to be wrong. So it really doesn't bother me, but there have been businesses that have gone out there. There's been Tangle Tees, you know, great story. You came on with a, with the, and I completely missed the point. You know, I said, well, I've got one of those for my horses. Well, it doesn't really, it didn't really matter. It taught me, it taught me thinking, well, actually the same product in a different marketplace, that's a good business. You know, I learned from Tangle Tees and they've, that's a, that's a great success story. I really, I, I, I hate the whole half full and half empty cup thing, but actually everything, I'm learning every day. I learn from the pictures, I learn from the entrepreneurs, you know, everything I do. And I honestly think that good comes from, you know, I shouldn't have invested. You know, he's gone on to do fantastic things. That's absolutely brilliant. And the thing that I learned, was I need to be a little bit more open mind. Reggae, reggae sauce. Reggae, reggae sauce. I got so f I got so fixated. To be fair, he got his numbers wrong by a factor of a thousand. You know, I mean, yeah, really. I got so fixated on that. I missed the point. I missed the point that he was lo he was amazing. You know, it was him. It was. And, and again, I learned to think. You know what? Stop looking at just the numbers. Look around the person. That you know. And but the, I don't see that with regret. I'm just. It just doesn't really. I'm not a regretter. Um, the far left over there. Hi Deborah, um, it's great to see you. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice for somebody that sort of wants to get into sort of property development? <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, actually, um, oh, I don't know. It sounds like you. It's, why do you? Sorry, what's your background? Have you got have you got knowledge and property? Um, no, I don't. No, not at all. Um, it's <laughs> ah. that's, that's the thing. It's sort of like a, a kind of family thing. My parents are sort of approaching retirement, and I was having a conversation with my, my mum, and I was like, perhaps we should get into property development, you know, to keep the income coming or something coming yeah, in. Yeah. So, um, so I separate 
property in into uh, our property, which we spend, I promise you, way too much. I mean, I'm totally overcapitalized on our house. I mean, I would be saying to somebody else, you are barking. You shouldn't be spending that money. If you're going into property development, you're not buying houses and building them to the house that you want. You've got to be very clear. It's, it's no different to any other business. You've got to know your market. You've got to know why you're doing it. I don't know whether you're talking about renting or actually just buying capital, you know, rent and then capital growth, but you've got to make sure that you understand why that property is good, not just that's a nice house, I'd love to develop it, because too many people do that. You know, it, it's got to be, well, because I intend to rent to students, therefore it needs to look like this and I'll keep it for that many years. It's just a business proposition, it's no different. Um, and as I say, too many people get themselves into trouble because they get emotionally involved in it and they have the kitchen that they want and they want the, you know, the better taps and the, uh, maybe that's, maybe that's that's the market that you're going for, but you've got to know why you're doing it, you know, and, and make sure. It, I always, I, I do find writing, I'm still a writer downer, I'm afraid, and I never look, I always write my reasons down, you know, and then I never look at them again. It's, it's gone into my head and I have to sometimes check my decision making against, hold on a minute, why are we doing this? You know, because it's very easy to get carried away. Is, is that at all helpful? Is there anyone with the right at the back? Hi, Deborah. Thank you for your talk. Um, I just wanted to know what you thought of the UK and the EU and how you would have felt it could have affected any of your businesses if the UK hadn't been in the EU. I am totally pro-EU. I, I... The facts speak for themselves. They are our biggest trading partners. It, it, I, I honestly, I mean... I will, of course, see two sides of the argument because I can see two sides to every argument and you need to see two sides or you need to see all of the argument to actually get whether yours is right or not. But I mean, of course it's easier to trade while we're in the EU and anybody who thinks it isn't going to be easier to trade is absolutely, you know, they're... It, Disillusion, and if it's easier to trade, it means that we have more. We make more stuff. We export more stuff. We have more jobs. You know, I, I, I really, I worry. I really, really worry that we will. We have this weird thing about the EU. We have this sort of hate. We have this love-hate relationship, and we we measure it on the fact that some crazy health and safety law came in once. You know, or what are they doing messing around with the way we make our sausages? You know, and 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 they would pick up these these sort of marker points, and everybody goes, "Oh, that's mad! We need to come out of the EU," without really understanding. And I think that the the government's job now is to actually properly lay the arguments out, properly lay the arguments out, so people understand the fact and then don't just lay the arguments out engage people because they're going to make the decision based on the wrong factors because you know because of a silly health and safety law that that you know probably had nothing to do with the EU in the first place so I am unequivocal pro-EU <coughs> yeah if we just go just here Uh, hi, thank you very much indeed for your talk. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, two questions. First of all, um, how long roughly do you find that you spend with the businesses in which you invest in Dragon's Den? What sort of points do you look for to leave them, perhaps, to move on from them? Um, the second one is, uh, one of the good things about Dragon's Den, the quite amusing thing from a TV point of view, is seeing how you engage as a group of five. It's a bit like the Top Gear relationship, that you're all quite different. Um, do you have a sort of a preferred series when there was a group of the other four with whom you felt you had the best accord, rapport? And I suppose conversely, as a, a group of people whom you would rather not have been on TV with? <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually think, is anybody watching the latest series of Dragon's Den? I actually think we've got to, I genuinely think, you know, listen, even if I didn't, by the way, I'd be saying this because it's the BBC and I'd be saying this is the best group of dragons anyway, but trust me, I mean it this time. It is, I, I actually think we're working very well at the moment. We're all very, very different. I think just having new dragons is good because I think it, it it makes us change. You know, it's what I was saying about to make life change, you've got to change something. And actually you can't, dragons is five, people sitting in chairs with entrepreneurs coming in and pitching. The only thing you can change is the dragons and the entrepreneurs. And I think when you change the dragons, we up our game. We, we you know, I've, I've had to spend the last series, I had to work out what the other dragons were doing and the other dragons were thinking. So, um, you know, so I, I, I think this is a good set. Um, I think 
when I first joined, who was that? That was Theo. I miss Theo. Theo was a very, very good dragon. He was, and he, he filled the retail space very, very well. He's a good man, good dragon. Um, so there was Peter, Theo, Duncan, myself, and Richard Farley. I think that was a pretty strong set. Um, yeah, I would say that was the strongest set, although I was new, so I didn't really know. Yeah, I, I, you know, I wasn't really as familiar, and I think now we've probably got the second strongest as a set of dragons. Sorry, what was the first time? I'm really sorry. Uh, at what point you you feel that you should move on from your businesses, your investments within uh, so, how long you spend? It? So what I do with my businesses, we all do completely differently, but what I do with my businesses is that I, the first thing I do is visit them, and I spend time with them. So I, not, they have a view on what they think they want. I want to get a glimpse of what I think they need um, and that can take quite a bit of time at the beginning then what I do is I match them because I've got 29 bits 29 or 30 businesses that's terrible isn't it 29 I think 29 businesses um, I can't possibly give them enough time and attention if they need it so what I do I match them with somebody that it's an entrepreneur they've been there they've done it themselves not somebody who works for me somebody I know in life and I then often give them a piece of the action. I'll give them some of my share and I will ask the entrepreneur, I'll introduce them, I'll say, does this work? And I will get that person to work with them, be their first port of call. And that way they've got somebody on call all of the time. They can then use me when I should be used. I shouldn't be involved in the day. You know, I shouldn't be that person. They pick the phone up and say, oh, Deborah, should we do this? You know, they, they need to use me for strategy. Usually I should be, stra you know, strategy and exit. I can be very helpful at exit. So that's, that, tends to, that tends to be how much time some people, actually some people just need the money. You know, they don't need a lot of time. Other people, I won't name them, but I did have somebody was phoning me every day going, Deborah, I'm not gonna call you every day. And it's like, but you are, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> when does it stop? So, and your, your report, I know what's behind that and you're absolutely right because the most important thing is that we don't become embedded in their businesses. You know, they have got, they are, this is, they own the businesses. We are there to enhance their businesses and it's very, very important. And it's odd. All the decisions they were making the day before we get involved or I get involved, they stop making. It's like now I'm on, like they lose their confidence and it's a weird thing, you know, and I, and I have to step back and say, guys, it's your business. You know, you carry on doing what you're doing. I'm here to make it better, but I'm not here to undermine you and, you know, take you, take you back. Uh, great, we'll go just to the question that was just there. Hello, Deborah. My name Hello. is Daniela Petrovic. Uh, uh, I'm really glad that you came. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, I'm a big fan and I have uh, two questions for you. One is, uh, uh, would you rather invest in business that requires more capital than your time? or vice versa, because there are, especially in technology space where I work, uh, there are people who, who know their graph and they, uh, they would probably uh, uh, need your, uh, 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 probably more capital than, than your involvement. But there are also other areas where they, they would need more um, connections and more time uh, uh, in that way. Uh, so that's first question. And second one is there is a huge amount of research here at Oxford, especially in biomedical space and biomedical technology. When you try to um, uh, implement that research into uh, big organizations like NHS, uh, uh, we hit uh, uh, big obstacles. Uh, is there something where uh, investors like yourself would be able to help uh, um, uh, the young businesses so so the first question uh, time or capital I don't I don't mind but actually um, this will sound odd but the money's the easy bit you know I mean that it, it, it's an easy investment when you say look I believe you I think this is a good investment there's my cash off I go tell me when it, tell me when you made me lots of money you know that that's easy um, so for me to actually put my time in, I've got to feel it. You know, I've got to want to, to, to get involved. And I say that in Dragons, I don't need any more businesses. You know, so when I get involved with a business, it's because I want to, you know, and I, you might have seen anybody what, who watches Dragons might well have seen me say, you know what, I don't think, I don't think you care enough. You know, I think I care more than you do about this business. Um, so I don't mind, but I need to be very clear on what it is. And I have to, it's a good question because I put it into those slots. Do you just want my money 
or do you actually want my time? If you want my time, I've got to feel the business, you know, because and, and I've got to be able to add something, you know, there's no point in me sitting anything, I know nothing about it. And in terms of new technology, it's very interesting because I was talking to the medi medical detection dogs today, you know, and some of the stuff that they're doing. And I, uh, Paul and I are involved with quite a few charities that, um, you know, support a lot of research. And often what comes out of that is, is research that's done for charitable use, but then actually re research that out of that falls some commercial aspect. So all that has to happen then is that has to be bundled up in a commercial way. You know, that just, that's an investment. It kind of doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter to an investor, where, you know, where it came from. It just has to be shown to me in a way that proves to me, not proves as much as you can prove, you know, that, that there's an opportunity here and that this would be used. That's, that's all, you know. Business is so easy. Honestly, you know, I, I just, I spend my life saying to people, please don't think I'm clever, because it's really, really easy, you know, but, but, but people bundle things up into, you know, they kind of think, you know, research is one thing and the business side of the commercial is another thing and charity is another thing. They're all, they're all you know, it, it, they all have to behave in the same way. You know, there has to be, there has to be a product, there has to be a reason for it, there has to be an outcome for it, there has to be, you know, it's all the same sort of thing. So, but, but you just need to know your audience and you need to talk to me in a business type way because I'm not a scientist. I won't understand the research. Tell me why there's a market. There could be a market in this. Tell me why I'd be interested in investing. Um, I think we've got time for one last question. Um, that was a very quick hand to go up, so if we could just go there. Thanks. Hi. Um, thanks very much for your time. It's really helpful. Um, there's been a lot of discussion from CEOs recently about resources and resource management specifically with regards to their energy. And you've touched briefly on time and trying to make sure that you've directed your time and available energy to the correct way. But I was wondering where you place yourself on the spectrum of of managing energy and business from the Harriet Green extreme of sleeping for three hours a night to, to people who are perhaps uh, needing of more sleep, probably like most of us. Um, and I just wondered, how do you manage that equilibrium, particularly with the view to having a long-term career? Do you have any take on that? Sorry, do you mean your energy, your, per your, your per no, personally? No, sorry, um, yours. Mine? Yeah, so how do you manage your energy and do you have advice, I suppose, more generally? Oh, I'm hyperactive. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I don't manage my energy. I just, I don't know. Um, I'm, I've always been, much to my father's um, disgust, I've always worked when a business needs me. So I've never worked nine to five. I used to turn up to my first my only job, um, late, because actually nothing happened at nine o'clock in the morning. You know, it didn't get busy till 10 o'clock and I really didn't feel the need to get in at nine o'clock and sit there and twiddle my thumbs because everybody expected me there at nine o'clock, you know. Uh, but I also wouldn't be out the door or I would be out the door. You know, I, if I finished at four o'clock, I'd go. So I've always had this thing that says, I do when I do what I do when I'm productive. And if I'm not being productive, just stop doing it, you know. And, and um, I think it, that's, that's more in tune now than it was in my day. In my day, you know, you turn, you you were the first in the morning and you were the last person out at night and that's how you were judged on how good you were, you know. That was it. Whereas now, if there's a lot more, you know, fluidity in, in, in the way that you can work. So I think the most important thing is prioritising and making sure your downtime, and that's the most important thing, because we can all work. I'm, your job's never done. You know, you've got to accept your job never, never finishes. So you've got to be able to manage your downtime and say, well, actually, you know, that bit of the job's done. And I need, I need to charge up my resources like a, like a battery. That is as important. Um, but only be there when you need to be, because I see so much time wasted and so much energy wasted, you know, and making sure that I'm doing things that, that have proper output. You know, I, I, I see people work so hard and achieve so little. You know, it's, it's heartbreaking and they think they're doing such a good job, you know, and it's just, please, you know, work an hour a day, just be more effective, you know, but it, it, there's a lot of pressure on people to do long hours, you know, there's a lot of pressure on, you get into some of these highly charged environments, you've got to be there first thing and you've got to be there, I won't play that game, I'm not interested in it, you know, so I think, I think, you know, set your own rules, 
set your own rules, make sure you're effective, make sure you, you, when you're doing it, you're on it. And when you're not on it, just think, you know what, I need downtime, that's it. I'd, I, no magic. Was that, was that the question you were asking? Did that answer the question? Yeah, good. Well, thank you so much, Deborah, for joining us this afternoon. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, if I could just ask everyone to remain in their seats whilst Deborah and I leave. But ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together one last time. Deborah Meaden.